Just to just go around very briefly to, so that you can introduce yourself and uh, primarily what is the product or service you'd like to market in China. One question. And the second question is, what is the status of your company in relation to China? Are you already exporting, importing, looking for partners? Just very briefly, just so I can get a glimpse of who I'm talking to. Sure. So uh, my name is Steve Graham. I'm CEO of uh, Incorporated in Moncton. Yes. Uh, we are a medical technology company, and we're developed a breath test to identify lung cancer. That's great. And That's we great. Don't, we don't have any exposure to China. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, my name is Yong. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from China. Yes. I've been here only uh, one month and uh, five days. Wow. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. I, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, he gave me the idea about this meeting today. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not looking for the, how can I see the business opportunity in China, mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, to join this meeting to find out what is the uh, opportunity for myself, yes. with you, or the business name. Uh, uh, uh. Because in China, I have some uh, network. Uh, Great. Thank uh, you. I see. I'm working for some retail mm. supermarket. Mm. For example, Jiangsu Province, oh, Shanghai, yes, yes. and uh, Zhejiang Province. Okay. Uh, because I'm new here, I'm trying to uh, understand. Uh, yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Hope the meeting will give you some insight. 呃，加拿大双语文化，啊，好，来。Thank you, Mr. Yu. Maybe, uh, quickly. I guess I can speak in Chinese. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Good. My name is Li Mingyu. Yeah. I'm president of New Brunswick, a newcomer business association of New Brunswick. Okay, very good. So, we are looking for the, you know, to connect. Yes. You know, the business yes. here and the market in China, because I don't think the market here is big enough for... <laughs> well, the, yeah. all, Canadian com not. all Canadian companies must become exporter yeah, at yeah. some time, that's for so sure. Maybe, you know, uh, to promote uh, export. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. yeah. And so one of our own Very good, yeah. thank you. So you can see the quick and the bad, bad speech, right? <laughs> exactly. Here, Very good, right? Very good. Yeah. thank you. Uh, my name is Jenna McDonald, the record of Port Feldon, which is a seaport yes. located in northern New Brunswick. Yes. And we import and export bulk and bring bulk commodities uh, to China. You work with exporters, uh, we, I mean, as, as the port, right? Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Bonjour. My name is Charles Cadet. I'm a trade commissioner with Global Affairs Canada. All right. I'm based here in New Brunswick. Welcome. And uh, potentially going to China. Oh, you may be posted. Uh, no, not posted, but working uh, with the delegation. With the delegation. Okay, very good. Thank you. Roger Mayot, uh, I'm with OMB. I handle the China file. Rachel Yu, um, I'm with the Department of Economics uh, at UMB. I'm wearing three hats in here today. One being a researcher and observer, and trying to you know engage in research related to public policy, mm -hmm. tips like this, mm -hmm. the impact on the province. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that I'm also here that with an interest um, in um, connecting with uh, other parts, you know, other uh, people, entrepreneurs in here, and I'm a special advisor to the newly established uh, NBAMD, which is the Newcomer Business Association in New Brunswick. And the third uh, role here is that um, I'm also helping UMB to promote their educational programs in China, yes. including a lot of professional programs. Yes. And so, so, so. and I'm sorry to ask, were you uh, are you from China originally, I born and raised in China? Originally educated here in Canada, okay. Canada for 33 years. Very good. Well, I won't say welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, I'm Chris Garens. I'm the director of sales at uh, Measurand. We're a company based yes. in Fredericton, and we manufacture an instrument used for geotechnical uh, engineering. Yes. So basically, just movements of the earth and such. Um, we do you remember what time? 
We have a uh, we export globally. Um, we do some business in China. We have an agent there, but I think we're missing a large part of the market. So we're hoping to learn more about the uh -huh. just China in general, uh, how we can sell more of our products there. And just yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Erica May. I'm also with Measurend. Um, my focus is basically how to grow the business globally and uh, everything that you said. So. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Stephen Wong from Hockey Shot. Uh, we were originally founded in Moncton 23 years ago. And uh, last year we opened up an office in Toronto, a flagship office. Uh, and we do hockey training aids. One of our top selling products is synthetic ice. So it's plastic ice, so you get full, uh, the full skating experience, full edge control, you do full stops on it. And uh, I've been to China uh, for the past two years. Uh, the NHL goes, uh, they're having exhibition games. China has a mandate of really uh, aggressively uh, promoting hockey sports, or ice sports, including hockey, leading up to the 2022 game. Uh, last year when I was there with the NHL at the same time, uh, we did some big deals um, and we're looking to continue that um, as we approach the Olympics. Great, thank you. Ian Kelly, good fan of consulting. Uh, we, uh, we are kind of a brokerage uh, firm. We source up commodities for the Chinese market like, like sugar, chicken, chicken parts and yes. like that. And we we uh, match buyers and sellers and we mainly deal with Brazil. Are, are you are you uh, uh, transacting with Chinese uh, okay clients? Okay, very good. Just what kind of volume or proportion of your uh, volume is going to China? Okay, very good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Serge Corin. I, I lead uh, an own uh, manufacturing company. We are involved in the uh, HVAC industry and specifically uh, in for residential market. Basically, what we are doing through advanced technology, we have homeowners and occupants to address indoor air quality issues. Okay, yes. And uh, we are exporting, uh, I would say, a lot because it's over 80% of our products, but too much focus on the United States so far. And so we went through, I would say, some tricky situations. Yeah. And uh, that's why I uh, was looking to expand in the both sides of Canada, and in the EU, and as well in China. Okay. So I pulled out from supply in China, so from Chinese manufacturing, but I would like to much more to export. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yes. And uh, we are only ex we are only um, pet food manufacturer in Montreal, mm -hmm. and uh, closely um, working on looking for um, partners in China in order to distribute the products and uh, work on the registration for the um, Ministry of Agriculture. Sure. Make USIQ as well that yeah. you're gonna have to deal with. Okay. Uh, have you begun dealing with them? Uh, not yet. We're still looking for a partner. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, we'll, we'll be able to address that quickly as well. Hi, uh, I'm Emily Corey, also with Corey Nutrition Company. Uh, I guess my roles at the company are many, but I do some of the nutrition and research and development uh, of our products as well as uh, I'm just a bit of a representative as well. Um, Jay pretty much covered. Uh, There's a great opportunity for you guys in China. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Suzanne? Good. Hi. Roger introduced me, Director of Trade at OMB, leading our mission coming up in November, <coughs> with some of you in the room, really looking forward to going back, um, especially interested in the company we're taking over for the first time, me and Roger and I are really digging into what you need so we can, we can help you out. Thrilled that Andre Philippe and his team are, are partnering with us on the mission. It's all about him and his story this morning, and so afterwards we'll, we'll dig into the trip and the mission program itself. Um, but if you need support, um, you know, Andre Philippe and team are very well equipped with their research and their connections to help you out. So even yep. if you're not on the mission, you might want to be thinking about 
Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Sudan. Okay, well, let's begin. Uh, I think just having heard and understood the uh, introduction of uh, everyone, I think this, today's presentation will be of meaning. Uh, I certainly hope so. Um, as I was saying before we go around the table, uh, we will look at a, uh, a lot of context because before looking at business culture. Uh, the reason is uh, simple. Uh, I've seen in my seven years of uh, work at CCBC too, mo too many, merci, thank you. I was, I was going to dance to Katy Perry while uh, talking. Um, so the, uh, I've seen too many presentations on business culture and etiquette that would jump right into uh, communication strategies or behavior you should adapt without going through the context. And I always get out of those uh, meetings or presentations with a, kind of an aftertaste of like, well, how, how, why, or you know, what is the, what is the, is there truth behind this? How can I really use it on a daily or into a business development strategy? Right. So yes, it's in-depth look at business and culture and etiquette, but at CCBC. We focus on data-driven business intelligence, right? We give you the numbers, we give you the strategy so that you can take action. Uh, and I've been dealing with China for over seven years now, lived in Shanghai for a year and a half, leading the Shanghai chapter of CCBC. Um, so I speak of experience when I uh, tell you that you know, you're gonna have to deploy specific strategies in order to uh, further down for further uh, your business development in China. So we're going to look at a few things. First of all, the business calendar into China, because we have too many of our members that are actually t calling us saying, hey, I'll be in China in two weeks. Can you help me book meetings? And they don't realize that they just booked themselves into a, a major holiday and that they're going to miss out or they're going to be stuck in a, a way, a, a sea of people. So uh, you need. Uh, we're going to cover this very briefly into 10, 12 minutes. Then we will look at at um, um, the Canada Partner Network, people that you should connect with uh, on, on in, into China and share your strategies with once they are you know, put together. Uh, there's a reason behind that is that China is a team sport. It's a team sport. Do not go there alone thinking that you yourself and your small team can do it. You need to over communicate with stakeholders. All right. So we'll look at who you should communicate with. Those are just ideas and you may have a few more to add on your own uh, on your own um, Rolodex. Then we will look at the China government structure very briefly. It's not a political science class, but uh, again, too many of our members or uh, companies go into China not knowing uh, or not, they don't understand when we say, well, you need to speak with the Department of Commerce. It's like the Department of Commerce or the Commission of Commerce. Those are actually on the same level, depending on where you look at, but they don't understand where we are pointing into the government when we say those words. So we'll just give you a brief, brief overview. Uh, we'll then look then at business culture and you'll see that, you know, I'm going to hammer on uh, some nails a number of times actually throughout all of those uh, all of those uh, topics because um, most of these are actually intertwined and there's kinds of a mind there's kind of a mindset you need to develop I think in order to be able to have a, the right posture when going into China and mo many of those words I'll use again and again and you'll see and maybe once you go to China and you'll come back you'll 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 realize why I speak of posturing projection and you know preparation in terms of regulatory as well uh, approach. Uh, those are all things and topics that we'll hopefully discuss in, uh, and that you'll be able to walk out of this room with you know, some kind of strategy and way forward. Um, I speak very fast, I'm sorry, but I have uh, so many information that I need to cover that I'm gonna have to keep that pace for two hours and a half. Also, I'm a former teacher in history and politics, so if you don't stop me, I may just you know push, go through. So uh, it's always a pleasure to kind of share knowledge and everything, I get very excited when I do that. Uh, we were launched in 1978 as Canada-China Business Council. I am the Quebec chapter director, and I'm also in charge of Atlantic provinces, uh, where we are actually raising our, our level of uh, commitment and, and activity uh, substantially. So we were launched in 1978 as the Canada-China Business Council. It was actually a trade council then. Uh, and our founding members are the very first Canadian commercial delegation into China. 
This, and I, as a history teacher, when I got hired at CCBC, I could not um, resist but dive into our archives and look at the verbatims of the very first meetings, the very first board of director meetings. And um, we have the verbatim of, uh, of, 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 of Paul Desmarais Sr., our founding chairman, meeting with a Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Trudeau and saying to him, well, you know, congratulations on recognizing China as the, uh, the, the official government. Uh, however, uh, we feel that the federal government should do more to support private businesses in China. And Trudeau answered to him, well, we've done our share. We've recognized the country. We've opened the door. Now walk through it, right? Get some business there. Uh, and naturally, in 1976, China was for large companies and wasn't an SME game, very different today. Uh, and so Mr. Desmarais pulled together the very first Canadian commercial delegation to China. He brought 10 other companies, large, lar large corporations, and it took eight years from 1978 to 86. It took eight years of negotiation between Power Corporation and CITIC to uh, seal the very first Sino-Canadian joint investment. I was in the pulp and paper industry in British Columbia. And then from then on, things picked up and started to, uh, to lead us to where we are today. So in 1994, uh, after um, about 15 years, 20 years of, uh, of existence, uh, our, our, some of our founding members gathered and uh, launched a founding uh, member fund, which gave us kind of the capacity to go and represent the Canada-China relationship in both good times and bad times, right? So we uh, are in fully independent, not-for-profit. We don't receive specific government funding for our operations. We're financed by membership and events that we put together. Uh, so we have the capacity to claim that we are neutral and apolitical in front of the Chinese government, which is actually one of our key assets. Um, you may recognize all of those logos, except this one uh, for mo most of you. This is the logo of CITIC. Think of it as, generally speaking, generally speaking, the CPPIB of China, right? The Pension Plan Investment Bureau, uh, where um, they were launched in 1976 uh, in order to well, prom manage pension funds, but they ballooned very rapidly into a very large conglomerate. They are involved in everything, investments, yes, and real estate, yes, and tourism, and publication, and editing, and media, name it. Um, and so CITIC is building a new headquarter, downtown Beijing, 108 floors, just CITIC. 108 floors, right? And this is a huge building. It's not a small, uh, slim tower. Um, and this is their headquarters, not their full office. I mean, they're scattered all over China. So it's, it's incredible. And it's one of our you know, core uh, partner in China, actually, CITIC was, yeah, uh, they, they were actually the host of that 78 delegation. So we've had a lasting relationship with CITIC since 40 years. Uh, it's not, this isn't meant to be an infomercial on CCBC. I just want to give you a bit of an overview of what we do. So we work with our members on three core pillars. First of all, we are a bilateral organization. Today, I'm in front of you as Canada China Business Council Quebec chapter, so yes, from the Canada entity, but we are also an NGO in China, a non-governmental organization. And we are the sole representative of the Canada China investment and trade relationship. And why I say sole is that yes, there are many associations representing Canada China relationship. However, the Chinese central government recognizes only one organization that bears the each bilateral relationship they have. So US CBC, the US China Business Council is the representative of US China trade and investment relationship. The CCBC is the representative of the Canada China trade and investment relationship. So just for your reference then, uh, this is a very useful position that we maintain and deploy on behalf of our members because we have the capacity to invite um, government leaders and de decision makers uh, to events and meetings, something that is very more, much more difficult to uh, other associations or agencies. Uh, we're also knowledgeable, so as I said, um, you know, once we're, I'm not in China, I'm in, I'm in Quebec and Atlantic provinces to help my members. So how can I put uh, forward uh, you know, files and ideas that are of meaning to our members and companies? Well, we develop data-driven business intelligence. So I speak and read Chinese, all my staff speak and read Chinese, and we access private and public databases to kind of chew on that information and provide to you what we call strategic 
two to three pagers, right? So we, we, one thing that's important is that we don't execute on behalf of our members. Well, I wish we would, but our membership fee would be 100 times that, right? So as a not-for-profit, we push that information for you in order so that to, for you to make a lightened, lightened decision. Um, then we're connected. Yes, we have a network, both private and public, into China. Um, now is not the time to look at that in detail. So we also have incubation centers, both in Beijing and in Shanghai, which we are able to host employees on your behalf um, so that they can represent your company uh, and project with stakeholders, be it public or private. However, they are. A, this is a rep office with which you can do representation, not transaction. If you want to do transactions in China, you need a WUFI, a wholly foreign-owned enterprise, and differentiating between a rep office and a WUFI is something that is not so hard, but it's not part of our presentation today because it's somewhat technical, and since we're more looking at stra market strategy here, um, we could discuss it offline if you want. Um, and so we do pre-market entry, market entry, and post-market entry strategy, for your reference, post-market entry is mostly public relation, governmental relation, advertise, mar you know, marketing, advertising, and so on. Uh, f uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> identifying the right opportunity and taking action at the right time. Who here is on WeChat? Everyone's on WeChat. Great. I'm not going to cover this. Uh, sir, you are not on WeChat. Download it. Uh, it's great. And uh, if, you, if, you ever, if you ever go to, the, go to China, you're going to need it. Um, it's, it's excessively useful, but I won't cover this since uh, too many people here are on. So looking at the business calendar, uh, it's, 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 we'll do this very quickly, right? But it's important, I believe, and we'll make some, uh, a lot of contextual comments, which I think uh, will be useful as well. So uh, the, the Chinese calendar is actually uh, two, uh, has two main facets. One is Luni Solar. It's based on the moon and the sun, right? It's part of their uh, historic calendar. And the other one is a Gregorian calendar, the same one that we use. Um, and it's important to understand that both are overlapping. Why? Because the Gregorian calendar was only enforced in 1949 when the communists took over. Uh, in 1912, during their Republic era, uh, from 1912, during their Republic era, uh, the Gregorian calendar was kind of approved. But the, uh, the Republic never had enough power to project it and enforce it. Uh, it, within the country. Only the communists in 1949 were able to do it. So you uh, still have um, celebrations and festivals that are based on, you know, most of them are based on the moon's face. Um, that's it. So the first you'll see, we'll look at New Year holiday very briefly, the spring festival. And why am I saying that is that there are kind of warnings that I want to put out there and we'll look as well at the business culture and how people's mindset are, 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 are you know, influenced by that uh, throughout these. Qingming Festival, Labor Day and Dragon Boat, again, just to give you a bit of context, what are they and when are they? Um, they're both, the three of them are in the spring season, so uh, you just need to be aware of what they are and when they are. And then Mid-Autumn Festival, National Day Holiday, which is actually ending today. Well, throughout the weekend, but people should be back in the office on uh, Saturday evening because people are usually working on the Sunday when they're taking a full day off. So just be aware of that. Um, all right, New Year party. Not so much to say, right? What do people do at New Year party? They look at the CCTV New Year, uh, New Year show, and you know it's a, it's it's it, there's not much to mention. It's on January first. Uh, everyone does it. Um, the the, uh, the the spring festival is much more important. In fact, if you're going to lead business in China on, in February, just focus on something else, right? Go to U.S. Go to Europe. It's just um, I, and and the, the 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 key thing to understand is that uh, China is excessively. Uh, intensive in terms of energy, in terms of communication. I guess you'll see it fast enough when you start dealing with clients over there. But you know, when they send you an email, they expect an answer pretty fast. And they, they, they need to communicate. And they, they will communicate. Uh, and if you don't, then you're going to slowly fade away in their, in their projects. Um, and why am I saying this here? Is that during the Spring Festival, they're taking a break. And I have a very deep respect for foreigners, expats, and Chinese professionals that are devoting their life to their business or their, their jobs. They're working 14, 16 hours a day just to make it happen. Um, and why is that? Well, supply and demand, right? Supply and demand. If you're looking for, in China, you're a Chinese worker or a graduate, a graduate, and you're looking for an easy nine to five job, you are surrounded by tens, if not hundreds of millions of people who are will also take a well-paid nine-to-five job. So they're very scarce, and 
chances are that this easy to do nine to five job is paid like a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month, right? Doesn't get you a vacation or it get, doesn't get you out of the rat race. If you're an ambitious or a hungry person and you want to get ahead in life in China, you're going to work 14, 16 hours a day just to show yourself and be able to get those opportunities, right? Supply and demand. I'm saying this here because during the Spring Festival, you need to, uh, you know, we, I appreciate leaving them uh, on their own because they're taking a break, especially in the context where many hundred, you know, hundreds of millions of people have come from the rural areas into cities in order to work. They have left their families, if not their children's behind to be raised by their, their parents, the grandchildren's grandparents. Um, and it is the only moment at which even if they're graduates, they can go back to their home country, to their home village and see their family. It is important then for them to connect and not think about work. And it's, it's funny, right? Because people in China, they're, they're work, if they're workaholic like that, if you send them an email with a request and they see it, chances are they're going to get to work and you know, they'll do it because they want to give you face and they want to get connect and yeah, they'll, they'll uphold your relationship. But you're still bugging them during the vacation, right? So just, it, the, the, so the, the benchmark is, you'll see in 2019 from February 4 to February 10. So two weeks before, one week after, is actually a no-go for us uh, in, in China. And you, you'll see things are slowing down. People will tell you, right, I'm, I'll be away and everything. And this is actually the, it's the key moment where people are taking off. They'll be working throughout the 24th, the 25th, the 26th of December, throughout Christmas up to January 1st. They'll take 24, 36 hours in January 1st. But their mindset on the January 1st is already set on the Chinese New Year. They need to close on that contract. They need to close on that deal before they're going off on vacation. And uh, if you happen to be in China during the uh, Spring Festival, God help you, right? Uh, Chuen Yuen, uh, which is the you know, transit period during the uh, Spring Festival, is very intensive on the tr uh, transport system. Uh, I, when I lived in China, I was scared, actually. Right? I didn't want to go out or use the train system during that period. I was just staying home. And you're walking the street, which we, you, you would usually be buzzing with sounds, and you can hear the bird chirp, chip, right? It's just like, wow, what's going on? So it's really interesting. And so um, if my, our cue is just avoid China two weeks before, one week after, because we, li we, li we leave them to rest, and uh, you know, we can pick up afterward, uh, no problem. Uh, you'll also face, if you're holding a lot of staff in China in the future, or even a small team, you may realize, gosh, I have a huge turnover, right? And my HR is just, I need to hire always new people. Why are people leaving? There's a really high HR turnover in China, especially on the labor force, people that are, that are manufacturing things. And it's just simple. If they're going back to their village, it takes them 36 hours to get there. Well, maybe they won't come back. It's just you need to kind of have be interesting enough to bring them back to the city right over and over again. So there's a, this is one of the many reasons why there would be a high turnover rate in your business in China. The Qingming Festival is the tomb cleaning festival where you go back to your home village again and you clean the tomb of your ancestor. Less and less celebrated or you know, practiced by the younger generation. Um, and the... the, uh, it, it, the Culture surrounding death has also evolved greatly. It's in the past century in China. People are not, not so much buried anymore, but inhumated. Uh, so that's many reasons why Qingming Festival may not be so much celebrated as tomb cleaning day, but people are still very much enjoying a three day off. Uh, you'll see that you know, 2019, April 5 on Friday, this is based on the lunar calendar again. So there's not much to say except just be aware that uh, this is a celebration that is part of, 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 uh, of the business calendar. The Labor Day is based on Gregorian calendar, right? Is the International Communist Labor Day uh, on May 1st. Uh, and people are celebrating and there's a lot of media messaging as well to celebrate workers and so on. So you'll see, you'll see that. Again, not much to say. I just want you to be aware that on May 1st is a national holiday. Um, and then the Dragon Boat Festival. Who here has already participated in the Dragon Boat Race? Not much people. Get in a Dragon Boat team. It's great. It's a, it's, it's a great team sport. Uh, I think the world would really benefit from knowing more about the Dragon Boat uh, sport. And China would dr greatly benefit as well from promoting that sport uh, globally, which is already on its way. Uh, there's a lot of competition, and it's really an, an extensive sport where if you don't work as a team, you're losing. And when I participated in my first competition, we lost 
dramatically all of our races. It was, I've seen, I've seen a photo where you're supposed to row all together, and in the photo where you are all in, out of sync, right, in different motion. Anyway, it's just very, very interesting. Um, so the Dragon Boat Festival, where people do boat races, Usually it's on that date, but you know, boat races will be held all across the summer. But on June 7th still, there is a three-day weekend that is Dragon Boat Festival. And uh, just for your reference, actually, the origin of Dragon Boat Festival is with um, a scholar during the Three Kingdom era named Xuan. And this scholar is actually at the root of um, China's patriotic um, I wouldn't say ideology, but co the concept of patriotism in China. So it, within his poem, he spoke of uh, a word called ai guo, like love your country, right? Love and country, ai guo, which is how you say patriotism in, China, in Chinese. Um, now, without going into, you can read it while I speak, right? Without into going into greater details as how and why a Dragon Boat Festival was born, know that... Um, the, 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 its origin within the Three Kingdom, uh, I would say, uh, how is it, the, the novel or the, the story of the Three Kingdom, because it is as well as a legend as it is a true, uh, history, the true history of China. Um, if you are looking for a good read and to understand what are Chinese seeing when they think of their own Middle Ages, uh, read the Three Kingdom, even a children's book. Open a children's book on Three Kingdom, you'll get it, and it's just very, there are video games on it, there are movies on it. Just try to involve yourself in the Three Kingdom mindset. You'll at least understand kind of the baseline of the imaginary, imaginary world that the Chinese people have when they think of their own kind of past and middle age. The Three Kingdom, you'll see symbols of that, you'll see products of that, it's just, so much heavily ingrained within their culture that uh, you are, if, you don't, if you're walking to China and you don't know the context of the story of the Three Kingdom, you're kind of missing a huge thing. Okay, it's, so you need to be aware of that. So Mid-Autumn Festival, and just going back right to Dragon Ball Festival, Labor Day, and Qingming Festival, those are spread throughout from April to May and June, so each month has one, and just so that it's part of your knowledge on the business calendar. But on the Mid-Autumn Festival, there are some important comments I need to make. First of all, you can see it was actually two weeks ago, on September 22nd to 24th. Uh, it's a three-day fe festival, so it should be from Friday, um, Saturday, and, and, uh, and Sunday uh, in 2019. <clears throat> and and, and the, the Mid-Autumn Festival uh, is celebrating, actually, the um, you know, the, uh, when P the harvest, so it's more of like the harvest moon uh, in, in, in Europe and so on. But one of the core traditions surrounding uh, Mid-Autumn Festival is the, mean, the moon cakes, all right? Uh, if you've not ever eaten a moon cakes, it's one of China's, you know, mo most refined delicacy. I'm not a fan, but, you know, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting food, uh, really. Uh, but so the moon cakes, however, uh, are a heavily charged symbol of the corruption in China. Uh, and if you are dealing with state-owned enterprise, and I'm not kidding, if you're dealing with state-owned enterprise or government officials in China, uh, please refrain yourself from being the good guy and sending a box of mooncakes uh, to, 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 that, to them. You may create some sort of really uncomfortable moment in their office where they're receiving mooncakes when uh, there's actually memos and um, no notice to them to not receive gifts on during the Mid-Autumn Festival. Uh, and this is all part of the two uh, 2012 and on anti-graft, anti-corruption movement by the central government. I mean, there has been anti-graft, anti-corruption drives beforehand but uh, it's not making the news. I wish it was actually, personally, in, in Canada, that we would see more news so that people would be aware of what, uh, is, is, you know, what Chinese people are living through. But the anti-graft movement, I've seen millions of people be arrested, losing their jobs uh, for corruption practices that they were either practicing or not, right? But that uh, I've been, uh, you know, this is actually a real movement and uh, uh, they're really pressurized into this. And, and to the defense of uh, the central government who's implementing that anti-corruption drive, how easy is it, right, to buy a mooncake box, lift the plastic case, throw in a pile of money, play, pull the plastic case and ship that to your partner? And just, oh, thank you. You receive your senior official, you receive 100 bucks during the, the, the mid-autumn festival, bring all of that home and take the cash out. Um, which is, you know, it's a scenario I'm proposing here, but that can be 
truly happening. So refrain yourself from gift giving during mid autumn festival. If you want, if you have one or two like close partner and you want to enjoy that festival with them, bring them out for dinner, right? Um, officials do not have limitations on you know dinners that they can have with clients and especially for state-owned enterprise. Um, but even people that hold public offices make a formal invitation to them to enjoy a dinner together, to celebrate Qingmi, uh, mid autumn festival, and you'll be all fine, all right? It's just that gift giving with public uh, stakeholders can be a bit tricky, uh, so try to avoid that. Uh, it's, not, it's not an issue. However, we'll talk about gift giving with uh, partners at signature of an agreement or a contract, for, for, for example which is all fine, which is all fine. The, these comments are made especially in the context of mid-autumn festival that has been seen as a vector of corruption really by the central government. Um, all right, National Day, October 1st to October 7th. Uh, this is Gregorian calendar every year. Uh, the, this is called the Golden Week. It's a week where no one does anything and it's just rest uh, or celebration of you know, the, the victory of the Communist Party as well. You know, it's not just resting, but uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's looked after, uh, it's celebrated, um, people are excessively proud as well, and uh, this year is the 69th anniversary of the Republic, next year is 70, so we're going to see a, a lot of celebration surrounding that. So just be aware, if you're going into China and you have, uh, you're have you looking for meetings on October 1st or 2nd, you're not going to get them, because uh, you're missing out. You, this is a national day and no, you know, there's technically no business is happening there, so just don't expect so much. I, it's not kind of a, this one is not a, a special holiday, but it still needs to be mentioned, right? The Shuang Yi um, Festival, which is the Singles Day, double 11, happens on November 11, naturally. Uh, and it, 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 it is the Black Friday versus Cyber Monday plus Cyber Monday in China. It's a, it's a day pushed, pushed by Alibaba, primarily. Uh, who controls the vast majority of the e-commerce into China, uh, and it it it, it um, destroys literally the numbers that uh, the U.S. can ac achieve on, on both their Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, I believe it was 6.5 billion dollars in sales for uh, in U.S. in 2017, and it, uh, two yes 2017, and it was 25 billion dollars uh, in 24 hours of sales for Alibaba in 2017. So. Uh, it's quite quite uh, impressive. It ju it puts as well an Im important or excessive pressure on the um, distribution system, right? The warehousing, the delivery system. People are not sleeping for 36, 48 hours, put, taking those orders out, uh, and, and so it can be on the supply chain very difficult to get the production in the warehouse. Have your 3PL partner manage the orders and push this to the clients. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, if you want to be part of this, be prepared and make sure that your warehouses are adequately stocked and that your 3PL, your third party logistic partner, right, can or have the capacity to manage your product into that, uh, in, into that uh, festival. Because it's an opportunity, it's also, you also need to manage your risk, right? If your, uh, your clients are ordering your products, but you're delivering a week or two after, or your back order, they're not gonna be happy. Chinese consumers are excessively, um, gosh, I have a blank, but they, you know, they're not, it's not that they're picky, it's just that they're, they're, they have a high level of expectations, both in delivery, in after-sales service, in communication. So you need to kind of be prepared in order to communicate with your clients and make sure that even though you have maybe have millions of clients in China, that each of them is happy, right? Um, so Christmas, not necessarily celebrated by families, but certainly visible in the society. You walk into every single mall or restaurants in China and you'll have this very same jingle, which will drive you crazy. But uh, the, the um, Christmas is very visible, yet very little celebrated by families. It's more, and m more or less seen as a consu consumer um, festival and it's a good moment to buy stuff to your family and you know give it to them this is what they see from us so you know they just, they're, they're not seeing us go to church so uh, and one there's less than 1.5 percent of the Chinese population is of Christian as well uh, confession so you, you, you won't necessarily see the Chinese trying to enforce uh, the, the, the celebration of Christmas uh, yet alone as well you need to be aw aware that uh, there are official memos from the uh, government into uh, all 
public stakeholders, be it universities, state-owned enterprise, and so on. Christmas is seen as an you know, unwanted Western influence. So there's actually, they have actually been briefed. Don't celebrate Christmas. It's Western influence. This is the central, you know, central committee of the Communist Party telling this to them. So yeah, whether or not, just uh, be aware. Uh, and um, still people, if you, if you have a team of people working for yourself in China, uh, we see most Western organizations are actually giving the 25th and the 26th as vacation days uh, because anyway, your offices here are closed. So why would you have your Chinese team working? And people in China uh, that are working in Western uh, or, or foreign companies are heavily appreciative still of having a day off so that they can tell their children, hey, I'm not working, it's Christmas, right? And they're spending a day together with their families. They will enjoy it, right? So if you want to share a bit of the Canadian culture, naturally have them off and not working at Christmas. Um, so yeah, on not so much of a festival, right? But still need to be on your, uh, your calendar. Uh, at early March, there is the Yanghui meetings, uh, which are, Yanghui is two meetings the two meetings meetings. Uh, and so the first meeting of the two meetings is the NPC, the National People's Congress. And the other one is the CCPCC, the Chinese, China Communist Party Consultative Committee, uh, which is a non-state organization where uh, all stakeholders, civil, other political parties, uh, and so on are invited to uh, give the feedback to the CCPCC that will report back at the National People's Congress. So they're like a, not a two-chamber system, right? But there are two meetings that communicate with one another. So the CCPCC is basically a promise from the government or um, this organization of like, like, give us your feedback. We will circulate that up and you can uh, comment and influence on the policies and what the central government is saying. This is basically the promise. But m let's say that the, uh, the NPC, the National People's Congress meeting, is basically the, uh, the um, legislative branch of the government meeting, enacting laws, regulations, and new rules, new plans, or giving mandates to uh, ministries and, and agencies at reforming certain policies as well. So I'm just saying, main comment is if you want to, or if you have a board meeting in April or in May, and you want to shine by giving them a regulatory update on China, look for those updates in mid-March. This is when most of the policies are, are, are at least announced. They may not be enacted yet, but you will have mid-March a very good view whether or not your market will be reformed, and if you need to have expenses related to lawyers and people thinking about that in the close future. Okay, so even sometimes they, they may be announced in one year or two years uh, ahead. So if you have, or if you have to hire someone to do a regulatory update on your behalf, mid-March is the right time after the Lianghui meeting. And, and again, you know, this is part of the agenda, why? Because um, you will have a very hard time getting officials, be it from working level to leader level, you will have a very hard time getting them on a meeting or getting commitments out of them, decisions out of them, uh, two weeks before up to the end of Lianghui. Even maybe a week after, because they're still being briefed on how, what's going to happen and what they need to do. Uh, and we have uh, ourselves, because we're requesting some of those meetings on behalf of our members or for ourselves, and it's, it's, it's standard to not ask for meetings two weeks before. You're going to get declined. People are all looking at Beijing because their boss is flying to Beijing and there will, you know, there will be kind of changes. They don't want to put their neck out as well because if they take a decision, that's going to be uh, declined by Yang Hui. Um, so there's a political risk management for them in not taking meetings before that. So just in the context, I won't kind of go back, but the Spring Festival is a no-go for you know, two weeks, early February to mid-February, and then you have Yanghui early March. So technically, political and public office uh, holders are out of the game from early February up to mid-March. So you need to be aware of that, uh, that it's, uh, China is about timing. You need to be in market at the right time in order to push through your request because people will process that and then they'll stop because they, and they'll wait until the cycle is over to, in order to start working again. Um, every five years, there's the uh, China Communist Party National Congress as well, which 
you should consider, uh, and, and we'll make kind of more structural comments regarding that later, but still, uh, there are also uh, Communist Party meetings mid-November every year, but they vary whether they're late November, mid-November, but and they're not necessarily institutionalized. It depends on the ministry and so on, so uh, I, it's not part of this. So from New Year's Day, between New Year's Day and Chinese New Year, this is a good moment that you should go because people want to close on their mandate. They need to get things done before their, uh, the, the Spring Festival. Then there's Yandong Lianghui, which needs to be in your calendar if you're dealing with public uh, office holder. Then Qingming Labor Day and Dragon Boat. This is not a no-go, but it still needs to be on your calendar. Then from all of the summer, from Dragon Boat to Mid-Autumn Festival, summer is good. Summer people are working, if business as usual, it's, it's, it's happening. Mid-Autumn to National Day, depending, you may have a week most people this year, from the twenty uh, mid autumn was twenty second. Uh, you you peep, most uh, most people I know in China took a week off between the twenty fourth to October first, so they enjoyed two week and a half. So this was actually off, uh, and we're actually waiting on Sunday for people to start working because. We have emails. Um, then there's the National Congress or uh, meetings, which are, is not necessarily a no-go, but you may, if you have difficulty meetings with your public uh, stakeholders uh, during that time, well, just be aware, Christmas, no worries, and then cycle goes on. All right, any questions? Am I on time? Oh, gosh. Okay, China is a team sport. Uh, we're, we're going to look at um, both paragovernmental agencies, public agencies, as well as, uh, as, as a private partners, which you need to interact, you need to communicate with in China. Uh, I, I focus here on federal agencies, however, you know, Opportunities New Brunswick, provincial stakeholders, COA as well, you need, uh, that, you, know, you need to communicate with them because they may as well be very strong channel up to those guys. Uh, so you need to make sure that your local partners are as well um, aware of your objectives. If you have NDAs or you have proprietary information that you don't want to share, just don't share it. But you know, put your bullet points, put your asks, communicate what you are looking for. When I say China is a team sport, it's like bridge, the, the card game. Bridge is a, it's a card game. Uh, bridge is when you, 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 you need to look at your colleagues, the, the, your team members, and they need to play the card. You need to give them a cue that they're going to play the card at the right time so that you can play your card and you can control the game, right? So it's like bridge because you need to cue the people in those network to play the right card at the right time because you're going to come in and you're going to achieve, okay? Uh, and you, if you go into China and you say, ah, I have all the cards I need in my hand. Uh -uh. Because if you need to get one meeting with one person at the right time and your sequence doesn't work, you're going to fail. And someone somewhere probably has this card, especially those guys, right? So um, you need to at least communicate who you are looking to meet, why you are looking to meet, and what you want to achieve. And you may get an email out of the blue, can you be in China next week? There's this meeting happening, he's gonna be there and you're going to have 30 seconds. You're going to fly to China, you're going to have to 30 seconds to make your ask. And somehow, somewhere, things will happen, right? Just keep pushing. Um, but I, I'm going to take one minute and give you an example of that. There's a leading Canadian entertainment company that is uh, holding a huge show in Shanghai. And they uh, have been pushing for months in order to get the fire department to visit their site and give them a, an accreditation or a permit of, uh, of, of, of exhibition. If the fire department doesn't come and doesn't get them uh, this per, get this permit, they will, they will be shut down by the government. They cannot hold their show. Millions of dollars are on the line. And unfortunately, it's not us, but the uh, service provider they hired filled the request to the wrong uh, to the wrong building for the fire department. So the good fire department never heard about it. But time is running out. Happens to be that they over communicate with their stakeholders and somewhere, somehow, CCBC receives an email from the mayor of that, uh, that, uh, that, that Shanghai region. Uh, so I should say, you know, sub area. I, I just have a blank on how exactly it's called. Um, and the mayor, this mayor, happens to visit Toronto and happens to want to meet with Canadian companies involved in his area. 
So, uh, uh, so we said, well, can you be in Toronto? There's kind of going to be the mayor there. He meets with them, 15 minutes, explains to them the situation. The show is in 48 hours. We are Sunday in, 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 in Canada. It's Monday morning in, in Toronto, uh, in China. And he met with the mayor at 48 hours. Just keep pushing. The door is going to open, right? Keep pushing. There's 48 hours left. He's not letting go. He's meeting with the mayor because someone somewhere had the right card and played it at the right time, and he's able to achieve. The mayor made the right calls. The, the, the firefighters showed up. He got his permit. Millions were saved. So you need to overcommunicate because somewhere, somehow, the, someone has the right card in their hand, and they can play it on time. This is how it's going to be. So uh, we're going to then look at those and uh, their services. What is CCBC? Hi, we've already said that. Said that. So CanCham, both in uh, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, both in Shanghai and Hong Kong, are useful local stakeholders. If you're looking to make promotion, marketing, uh, public relation, hire them up, do something with them. In, Ch in Shanghai, CCBC doesn't hold kind of you know, enjoyable cocktails or social life events. Why? Because Kanchan is doing such a great job. They are a good representative of the Canadian culture in, 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 in Shanghai, and we are focused on other objectives. So uh, for local Canadian life, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce is a great stakeholder. If you have Chinese staff in Shanghai area, and you're looking at giving them a Canadian experience, you want them to integrate to the Canadian community, get them a Kanchan membership. They'll go to cocktails, they'll go to local events, they'll meet with other Canadians, they'll be able to kind of say to their family, yeah, I'm working with Canada, I'm part of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Give them that social status. Help them integrate to the Canadian mindset. Um, so, Kancham uh, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, in Hong Kong as well, if you're looking at integrating in southern China, they can be very helpful. And technically, you should be aware both Kanchams are private businesses that play, have a business, uh, business plan of associations. It's not a bad thing. It's just, as I said, uh, if you need to meet with uh, political stakeholders or uh, agencies, it, it may not be the right channel to use. Um, but then you, they do have. Uh, they do have uh, political leaders at some of their events, uh, mainly through cooperating with Trade Commissioner Service and G uh, Consulate General. So services, standard association services, right? We're just going to go that quickly. CCPIT is excessively important in China. You uh, need to at least be aware where and be able to recognize that logo, right? It's the China Council for Promotion of International Trade. The China Council for Promotion of International Trade. They are. This is a huge organization. Every city, province, town, name it, sector has its own CCPIT instance that you can communicate with. 95% of the time, these guys don't speak English, uh, but it's, it's OK. See, uh, and my, my recommendation on CCPIT is that you need to be aware, at least, of that logo, this organization, because you're going to, going to hear about it. Trade shows are often organized by CCPIT. They are put together, managed by. Um, but CCBC holds a. Uh, a, a, a membership to CCPIT. We were actually up to 2016 hosted by CCPIT. Uh, and, and we have an extensive and very positive relationship with those guys all across the country. When we reach out uh, to them, wherever we go, they know about CCBC. They know we are the holder of that trade and investment relationship. So if you tell me, or if you send us an email and you say, hey, I'm going to Qingdao and I'm meeting with a client, is there anyone you, I should meet with them? I, I should meet other than, 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 than these clients. Uh, we'll look into our own Rolodex and our own, own uh, network. But if we don't have the person you're looking for, well, yes, we'll reach out to CCPIT because we have that membership and we can put them to work in order to access their local network. Right? So we extend our own network into CCPIT. Uh, HKTO, same thing, kind of. Uh, they have an office in Toronto. If, you need to, if you're going into Hong Kong, Reach out to them, share that with them, uh, and, and make sure that the information circulates, right? They are a government agency and stakeholders for Hong Kong with offices in Toronto. Uh, basic services. The Trade Commissioner services, 16 offices, 16 offices, 11 trade office, five consulate general, one embassy. This is the most extensive trade commissioner network internationally. Not even in the US is uh, the trade commissioner network that important because they don't need that. In China, the federal government made a very important investment. And every of those little red dots have uh, trade, uh, tr trade agents allocated to one, your, your, your sector. They may hold more than one sector, but they're still in charge of helping you. My key 
common to you guys is if you're looking at you know, minimizing the number of people you're emailing, reach out to the consulate general that is in charge of this area, and we can help you identify which one it is, and ask the trade commissioner allocated to your sector in these consulate general to copy the trade offices in the cities that you need uh, in the future so that they can actually outreach. I have a top-down approach even with the trade commissioners in China. In fact, have a top-down approach to everything in China, right? Have a top-down approach in China. If you are, can walk out with just one sentence, it's a, have a top-down approach. Speak with the leader. Okay? Working level, level people are great. They'll be able to execute on what you need and make sure that they have it on time, but they're not going to make the decision. There's one person in every organization making decisions in China, it's the leader. So it's the same thing for, 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 for Canada, right? But just have a top-down approach. It's, uh, it's, and what they can do, right? Market research, advertising and promotion, consultation uh, and market strategy, network. You can see it's very similar to CCBC. In fact, most of those organizations have very similar services. And we're not competing with the TCS, but we're playing the same bridge game, holding our own decks of cards, and maybe some of them are the same cards, maybe some of them are different, and we're just playing them in the same rhythm, right? EDC, uh, you may use or not their services, um, and I'm not an EDC representative, so it's, I'm not gonna go in details in how you know, what are their services, but their export guarantee uh, insurance is uh, excessively uh, important for Canadian exporters in China. They have a, a good team uh, in, in Shanghai and across China. Uh, but one important thing is that EDC can actually use, and uh, this is important, EDC can use your assets and your signed purchase orders in China in order to make available financing and raise as well your credit eligibility with banks, uh, with, 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 with your bank. So they can guarantee with the bank, in partnership with the banks, some of the financing you need, and they can uh, assess and vet the appeal uh, order and the contracts or the assets that you have in China. If you don't interact with EDC, you may get a, uh, a, a no at your bank because they will not commit themselves at securing that financing. You need to speak with EDC. They are the ones who will stamp your contract saying, yes, we accept or we, we find you know, these assets can be financed. Um, and, and so we have a lot of we often hear about members having trouble financing their, their operations in China because their banks won't recognize assets or PO orders. Um, EDC can help you into that process. Now, the next one is CCC. If you are dealing somehow with government procurement processes, speak with CCC. They, in the past years, have invested a lot in expanding their capacity into China. I'm speaking of experience because we're helping them. And we're, because what are they doing? They are you know, helping Canadian companies gain access to market uh, to government procurement channels, which can be dif very difficult uh, in China. We also at CCBC have a few hints and programs we can help you with that, make an assessment of the availability of mar market procurement, and we can kind of help you get at least the bid doc, sorry, the bid documents, um, uh, so that you can internally manage them with your team. But the Canadian Commercial Corporation is making a big push into China, and you can see that um, their offices are actually located within the TCS network, the Trade Officer Network in China. So they are covering the whole. Um, again, so accessing uh, speed up sales on foreign government, gaining competitive advantage, and so on. Now, FESCO is really important, and you may not have heard about them. It's one of many HR supplier uh, or HR uh, partners you could talk to, but FESCO was the very first, very first joint venture uh, in order to have foreign companies hire either local staff or foreign staff. A foreign company in China cannot legally hire and pay uh, staff. They cannot. They absolutely need to go through a third party. It can be FESCO, it can be someone else. Um, but you need a special permit in order to be able to uh, give out salaries to foreigners or local employees on behalf of foreign firms. And this is because there are five different social insurances that you need to register and maintain registration for each of employees. Um, labor contract, labor, labor law, labor contracting, in fact, hiring and managing HR in China is heavy. It is 
uh, much more, I would say much more difficult than in Canada because it's not our culture. Everything is in Chinese and it is regulatory heavy. Use a third party. Unless you are a mega corporation, which I not, have not seen around the table, you do not want to hold this internally. It will cost you about $60, $75 per employee per month, which is nothing, and they will take care of everything. In fact, at CCBC, we hold a 10, about 10, 12 uh, full-time staff in China, both locals and foreigners, and we actually use two different HR suppliers so that when one emails us, oh, there's a change in regulation, you're going to have to pay us a fee or do this, we actually email the other and we're like, hey, we received a news about a new regulation. Is that true? Can you confirm? And we just play one against the other in order to make sure we're not, uh, you know, someone is not being blinded on, on something. Why are we doing this? I'll just make a contextual comment as well, but you'll see I'm hitting on those nails over and over again. Is that China is a regulatory heavy environment. The central government issues policies and regulations. The ministries and uh, agencies issue issues, uh, policies and regulations. The cities and the provinces issues and your, your, uh, your, your again, I have this. Your city department issues regulations. So, no one in China, unless you are a super AI, can collide all of those documents and understand really where is the way and how does all of those documents overlap. This is why when you are in China, if you need to go to the labor department to have a piece of the, a paper chopped and signed, you're probably going to come back or your staff's probably going to come back two or three times saying, boss, I'm sorry, they didn't want to sign it, we're missing a document. And, uh, you're going to look, it's not in the list. Why do they ask this document? It's not in the list. Well, uh, the guy behind the counter said we needed that and we said, and you go back to your own communicating, it takes two or three days. You're going to do this two or three times for every single shop. And you get the feeling is like, why is the, am I dependent on the mood of the guy behind the counter to get my things chopped and signed? It's, it may be the case, but generally speaking, it's not. If you think about it logically, is that there's just so much regulation that they all want to make a good job. No one wants to make a mistake. So they're all thinking, well, maybe there's this as well that you need to take into consideration and I need to make this. And oftentimes they're just testing you as well. Are you ready? You know, do you want it? And so they, you'll have a lot of documents and people coming back, not being able to chop stuff. And so there's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of regulation. Hire. This is all about hire the right experts. Do not do everything internally. It's too much unless you have a team of 200 people. You could do it with 25 or 30, but it's like, do you have 30 administrative staff to do? And no, just hire the right experts and pay them well to not make any mistakes. Fesco can do that. Again, on legal, on banking. If you're doing, I'm not going to say no, it's just too much, but banking. Uh, most of Canadian banks have very good relationships with Chinese banks, like Bank of China and ICBC. And Bank of China and ICBC have huge databases in order to help vet the financial health of uh, buyers and, and partners. So if you have the Chinese name of a company, well, share it with your bank or Chinese bank with which we can help you interact directly if you're looking for, because they have the databases and they can help you issue a report or a document saying, well, you know, Yes, he's, uh, and there are many others as well. Sinosure, if you want to write that, Sinosure, S-I-N-O-S-U-R-E. This is the ED, China EDC, so they do export guarantee for the Chinese exporters, um, and they, ha they have extensive databases. When I was in China, I wanted to do a, a, a financial report assessment service, so we spent a lot of energy kind of doing a template and a case study and so on. We priced that service at $6,000 because we wanted to be professional and everything. Then someone came to me and said, hey, I just found this signature report. It's much better than ours. How much does it cost? $250. Cannot, you know, yeah, okay, scrap that, <laughs> continue. Why? Because it is, uh, they have armies and huge databases of people doing that work. So for $250, I tell you, I've seen it and I use it. We can, you can have, outstanding financial assessment through Sinoshore or Chinese bank. So just don't interact with stakeholders blindly, right? You have the capacity to get this financial information. It's just that it's going to be in Chinese. We can help you read with that. So then corporate services, something that's often overlooked because we don't use that in China, in Canada. But if you're looking at having a legal and or corporate entity or having someone manage your HR as well, I mean more on the labor, on the contracting, you're also, you're, you're going to have to deal with FESCO as another service supplier, but contract, doing your, your contracts and so on. You may use, yes, your legal firm here in Canada. However, be aware, 
No Canadian lawyers can perform law in China, right? You need to be a PRC lawyer. Very, 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 very few Canadian firms actually have PRC lawyers within their Canadian offices or their Chinese offices. So most of them will tell you, yeah, we have an office in China, we can help you with that. But their office in China is a rep office. It's not a law firm, it's a representative office that has relationship with other legal firms in China and they will outsource your product and make sure that the relationship and that they, they, they will deal with this legal firm and then they will get back to you saying, yes, we've done it. And you may hear about this other partner firm and so on, but then you're dealing with your own firm, giving them a cut to manage this relationship with this local firm. Maybe this is your plan. Maybe this is your strategy. And if that is, good for you. But if you're looking to deal directly with the people, people filling your paperwork, you need to deal with a Chinese legal firm. And we can help you with that as well. Or the few Canadian uh, firms that have PRC lawyer within their offices, which there are, but very few. So corporate services firms like Vistra are outstandingly useful because they can uh, they embed both the the, uh, the paperwork, the filing, the permits, the issuance, the dates, the, uh, the secretariat and administration, the tax, and, and so on. They're kind of a legal firms mixed with um, uh, fiscal firms, so you can uh, use them. Uh, they are uh, very uh, useful. All right, any questions on that? Good. I'm going to take a break. So our next step is to uh, look into more of a mindset. This is a case study, all right? Because we see I, in this, in this today in this uh, room, there are maybe two or three companies uh, plus government stakeholders that should be aware about uh, that should be aware of Made in China 2025. If you're not already, if you aren't directly involved in one of those ten sectors. Still listen to what I'm going to say because you don't. You, and but don't necessarily hear the words or the names of the document. Hear the mindset and the thought process behind what I'm going to say, because this is what the kind of thinking you need when you think of regulatory analysis in order to best identify how to position your pitch and your product in China. Okay, um, why am I presenting this as a case study for regulatory environment uh, analysis? You know, this is kind of a long word and name. Uh, whoops. So in 2017, we uh, completed this, ana this, uh, th th this file, which you will receive in our follow-up email with the presentation. It's what we call Chinese political hot words. Uh, not to say keywords. And uh, you'll see that you have important concepts from directions of the party uh, to, uh, and some of them, if you, if you read on China, you may have heard, right? The Tsing uh, Tsing integration, oh, sorry, it's on the next page. Uh, the Tsing Tsing integrations, which is the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, uh, integration uh, plan. There's the development of the Yangtze Economic Belt as well. There's naturally the Belt and Road Initiative, which you have heard about, right? Um, made in China 2025. You can see that it's in first. Um, some of them are some of them are excessively technical, right? The four-pronged comprehensive strategy. Uh, but I, I'll use this uh, five development concepts within the 13 five-year plan to uh, make uh, uh, my, my point. Um, we used um, documents issued by a special office from the State Council. So it's kind of the State Department for the US, right? Uh, or the Privy Council. Uh, so it's the State Council, uh, which um, has a special office for interprets and translators. In order for the political leaders of China to go abroad and make speeches that are translated to other languages in a systematic manner. Right? There's not, there's not three. Uh, this is maybe so. You know, if we look at Shuang Yin Ying Qing, uh, there's not 15 ways to tra to translate that. There's one way, and it's the two engine of of growth and development. So when translators and interpret hear that in Chinese, they know what English or French word to use, and so on. Uh, and it's excessively useful because we reverse engineer this into giving you the words you need to use in your marketing and your pitch so that you are aligned with what the leaders expect to hear. 
right? Take this and reverse engineer it. So we present this file to you uh, in order to take it and look at the core concepts of, uh, that is, are described. This is an eight-page document with the sources if you ever want to dive deeper. And you use those, those words that are aligned or close to your pitch and you, you define your marketing strategy in relation to these. So the five development concepts, for example, innovation, coordination. If you're into IT and you're into big data and so on, yes, you have coordination. Then you have green development. Opening up is about investment, uh, information sharing, and so on, international relations. Then sharing is about you know, um, applications, social economy, uh, and so on. But you, know, you, can you could read for hours on each of those topics, really. But we want to present them to you because it's important that you speak their language language. It's important that you speak their language. Oftentimes, the story goes as this. The Canadian companies go into China, they pitch their product. It's a great product, it's a great pitch. They had their marketing material prepared, they spoke a few, a bit few, a few words of Chinese, they had their translator, it was well done. But then the guys are looking at that and are saying, it's a good product, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. And it's not an issue of the product or the service, it's an issue of how you presented it. Right? Because you were not directly aligned with how, what they expect to see or what they expect to hear. Um, if you've never lived in China, uh, you'd be, you'll be surprised at how efficient the government communication machine is. They, they, they issue policies and regulations that are at a difficulty level that is unparalleled in Canada. You, you, you would have government officials, ministers, or the prime minister going into a speech like that, an hour and a half speech on policy for market development. You have people listening to it and just, okay, understanding it. People would go to sleep after five minutes in Canada, or they would just get up and walk away, right? Um, what if Canada had a 2016 to 2021 national development plan? What if we had one? Would you change your about us in your website and your, all of your marketing strategy in order to be 100% aligned on what there is in that plan? What if I tell you that this plan exists somewhere, right? Pretty sure we could find a five-year development plan for the industry in Canada. Are we all aligning ourselves on it? No. Because, you know, it's an individualistic country. We think we can do it on our own and so on. It's not the case in China. In China, everyone is 100% aligned on what the government will say and what the government will do because they there, there's been a 30-year promise that has worked of we're all going to get richer if we work together, just follow what the government says. This and other things, right? But, um, so I'm going to give you this example, one made in China in 25, 2025, of how I would and how we would at CCBC evaluate uh, in five minutes, right, on uh, evaluate a policy in relation to what are the opportunities that are underlying for a company associated to that. All right, so made in China 2025, issued in 2015, and uh, based on Industry 4.0. Uh, this, uh, you know, this is their kind of their end game in, in Germany that was enacted or launched in 2011 and enacted in 2013. And when I read the, about 2025 the first time, I was like, well, why does China want to upgrade their manufacturing capacity? Aren't they already the factory of the world, right? It's like, where is this going? Well, in fact, they actually need quite a lot of industrialization and robotization still. China is labor intensive. Uh, 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 manufacturing, and if you want the statistics, uh, they evaluate that for every 10,000 employees, there's 19 industrial robots being used in China. While in South Korea, there's 516. In the US and in Germany, there's like 309, and there's 200 and some uh, in, in the US. And there's 19 in China for 10,000 workers. So yes, they have the manufacturing capacity, but it's all by hand. So they need to industrialize. This in the context as well of an aging population, raising wage, and so on, right? There's a lot of points coming, trends coming together in order to push the government to do uh, this. Now, on all of those slides, I would say if you're the most important thing to note is China 2025, the plan identified the goals of raising local components from 40% in 2020 to 75% 70 by 2025. This is what the Chinese call a window of strategic opportunity. The window is open. Are you going to get through it? If you don't, the window will close. And once it's closed, it doesn't open back. Now, this is a bet as well from the Chinese government that their innovation and their domestic uh, innovation capacity will be strong enough 
for them to enact those policies and raising the core components, uh, local components requirements at this time, which uh, there are reasons to believe they will achieve it. There are reasons to believe they won't achieve it. But for foreign companies, it, uh, it has an opportunity to willingly integrate within the Chinese supply chain. And this is how you need to see it. China 2025 is not about receiving a PO uh, and, and, and shipping your container into China. If you're into, whoops, if you're into those fields, this will never happen. You need to integrate into China. But what if you have 60% of a huge pie versus 0% of a small pie, right? If you need to be there work with local stakeholders, both corporations, in order to integrate within their supply chain. Because why? Because 40% in 20 and 70% in 2025. China, the, the, government, uh, the government offers you financials and fiscal tools, market institutions, and you can also uh, integrate within the standardization of the industry. So they're really opening, willingly opening themselves to industrial um, knowledge internationally, but then with the promise that once, everyone, once enough people are in, we're closing it and we're raising core components uh, requirements. <clears throat> so cooperation with Chinese companies is key if you're into technology. And how do you do this? Well, you do this by investing in China. This is what they want to do. And in exchange, they will open the doors to you to their supply chain. But investing in China is possible for an SME. You just need to do it in the right angle. It could be having a team of two to three engineers in a, an incubation center that is also a research lab in order to research on a specific component, right? That is not the whole product, but that is still you know, a viable uh, technological advancement in your uh, supply chain. But you need to have come in somehow to officials uh, to, uh, to, and, use, and use their own policy uh, in order to push your product. Now, as I said, they're either going to achieve it and close the door, or they're going to still require more and more, and that window will keep open past 2020. Uh, but the, uh, the China 2025 is not so much part of, uh, a, you know, it's not a one-off. It is part of a longer plan. And China 2025, actually, if you talk about it openly now in China, you may, you may get like, oh, no, no, it's, we're, you know, we're, we, it's changed. Uh, we're not so much talking about it anymore and so on. Because the, 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 the word is that, well, you know, they've been pressurized by other countries. Like, what? You want to steal the, you want to take in the whole uh, manufacturing capacity of the world? You want to take over the manufacturing uh, capacity of the world? What, what country doesn't want to do that? It's just that China has a plan. And other countries, most countries don't have. Um, so they're not, not, not so much talking about it. But the real game plan within China, or, or that China 2025 is part of, is ending in 2049, which officially, for your reference, for Canadians in the room, is uh, when the great China rejuvenation of, of, of the country is happened, right? China has a long-term memory, especially for government officials. They have a long-term memory. And for their, for their memory, where, when does it start? 1834. Right, the four treaties that oh, that forced the opening uh, of, the, of of their uh, their ports to international uh, powers, foreign powers, and so for them, for the government, when you're from mid level to uh, senior decision maker, you are trained in order to take consideration into up to 2049, based on 1834, where China lost its place. So the Great China Rejuvenation is walking through China 2025. Now in China 2035, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to keep improving, re, uh, improving local industrialization by raising core components. I'm going to give you three examples of how Canadian companies uh, have, or Canadian companies have been using China 2025. Bombardier, for example, um, when they signed for a 10-year um, service contract for the Shanghai, with the Shanghai Metro within their joint venture, um, as mentioned, Pierre Baudouin has mentioned, another way to upgrade Chinese industries to foster cooperation with multinational cooperation, right? Foster cooperation with, I should, yes, multinational cooperation. Bombardier has been a key contributor to our six key joint venture and to uh, foster the development of the Chinese rail transportation industry one of the 10 sectors highlighted in the government plan. Something tells me that he has been repeating that code over and over and over again in, in private meetings in order to shore up Bombardier's involvement into the China 2025. You need to develop internally your talking points. There are not going to be many. 
three or five, that will be well designed based on these documents, actually based on, uh, based on, um, sorry, based on these documents, right? Those are kind of the core components of China 2045. So if you ever email me saying, hey, I'm interested in China 2025, how can I learn more? I'm going to send you that. And you're going to have to read it somehow or identify the core, the, core, the core talking points. Three to five talking points can go and get you a long way, right? Well aligned with the objectives. And if we start connecting the dots, um, why do you need to align yourselves on the objectives of the uh, government stakeholders? Well, how are people promoted in China? They're promoted at the Lianghui or they're promoted at the, uh, the Congress, if they're party or government. And how do they receive their promotion? They receive their promotion on their capacity to achieve the objectives that have been given to them in government plans. So if a local government has as an objective to lower its CO2 emission by 12% over the next five years, and you can do just that, and you walk into the room using the right words and the right pitch, and you tell them, I can lower your CO2 emissions. You don't tell them that based on your plan you need to do this, but you tell them, I can lower your CO2 emissions by 12% in the next five years. What is the guy on the, in front of you thinking? I'm going to get a promotion, right? He's, I'm going to achieve my objective. So you need to help them achieve their, the objective of what they have been given, right? It's, I think it's something like 300 million Chinese playing uh, winter sports in, uh, before the, the, the 2020 Olympic. That's a lot of people that the Hebei government needs to bring to, to the winter sport. So you know, you, I'm sure you already use them in your pitch, but there's probably other statistics that you need to take into consideration in order to shore up your pitch. Um, and uh, so in, in that context, uh, as I said, China is also multifaceted uh, regulation, emission, like enacting environment. So uh, you, you'll have, once you start kind of, okay, yes, we are part of China 2025, we want to look at this. When you look at one of these documents, when you look at one of these documents, what do you get? Well, you get some things like this one, right? It's a web page with uh, this, I think this was like four, four or five uh, pages of, of, of uh, uh, describing tax deferral treatment on profit distribution used for investment. So if you're making profit into China and you want to reinvest it into your labor for R&D, you're going to take, get tax deferral treatment over that. This is a national policy. But then you also need to look, and it's a, it's a comment I did not make, which I will make now. Uh, and you've already probably heard it, right? That don't go into China for the whole market. It's like if, you're start, if you start uh, looking at Europe and you're saying, yeah, we're going to hit Europe. Yeah, you can say this to your board, but what are you doing really, right? You're starting in France and you're starting in Paris and then you're slowly growing uh, away because you need to look at regulatory environment in France and then elsewhere. And yes, Europe has made a lot of efforts in order to uniformize, but there's a, a lot of levels still and things you need to consider between Germany and France and so on. It's the same thing in China. It's just that it's called China and it's, yes, a central government that is much, you know, a stronger and you know, less stricter than uh, Europe. But if you go to Shandong or if you, you go to, to, to Shanghai, it will be different regulatory environment. Same framework, but different content. So uh, even within, oh, it's a district, sorry. Uh, even within districts of cities, you will find that uh, HR policies, for example, labor and contract employment, taxation and social insurances differ. The, pro the way you register for a, a representative office in a, in a district in Shanghai, from district to district, is different. So that's why if you ask me, you know, how can I register a rep office? How can I get my permit for import-export uh, license and so on? Yeah, where do you want to register? And I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know everything, right? It's, 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 it's impossible. So use the right experts because it varies greatly from where you are. So <clears throat> tax deferral treatment on profit distribution, this is central government, central policy. But then you look at pilot cities or pilot projects or local regulations, right? And for example, Ningbo uh, is, uh, was the, named a, 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 a pilot city for Made in China 2025. So they have a lot of local policies, which I could not enumerate in front of you, but that are oriented toward facilitating investments and developments and uh, develop, you know, your, your company's implementation and so on. So look at, uh, find, select a province. Select a province, start with a province. And it's much easier to start with a province and say, okay, Shandong province, what's my regulatory environment? And then you look up 
and you say, oh, OK, central government has these things that influence me. But if you go and you say China and you start eating the China cake, you're never going to end. Right? Start with the province and see then how the central government policies influence you, not the other way around. Um, by the way, free trade zones, this is kind of the Ningbo free trade zone that um, has its own pitch on China 2025. Why? Well, because they're in Ningbo, right? Pilot city. So free trade zone is also aligned with that. But every free trade zone is also having its local policies, local call it whatever you want, they will have, be aligned on an industry that is heavily influenced by the city they are based into, right? The Shanghai uh, free trade zone, well, Shanghai is all about um, economic, um, sorry, uh, innovation and uh, high technology development. You could argue it's pretty close to China 2025, but it's not the same thing. Uh, and so uh, the, the you know, innovation is very uh, a high drive in Shanghai. And yes, the free trade zone wants to do that uh, in net international imports. Shanghai is kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a huge city, so they have a lot of stuff. But for your reference, the Shanghai free trade zone was extended two years ago, three years ago, uh, into the Lu Tsui area, financial area, financial district. So when you look at this huge downtown area on the other side of, uh, of, of the river in Shanghai, you're actually facing the free trade zone. This is a free trade zone now for the financial air, uh, for a financial district. So guess who are happy? The banks, right? So um, there are each city, Qingdao has a free trade zone. Harbin has a free trade zone. Tianjin has a free trade zone. And every of them have their own local policies, own, lo own local objectives that you can align yourselves with and that you will have to do the work in order to identify. So I don't want to scare you off. It's just that starting a China strategy takes a lot of work. Once you get those bullet points, once you get those kind of two to three strategic pager, which is this is our business plan, this is what we're going to do. You know, you can roll with it. It's not going to change in the next six months unless there's a big overhaul of your industry, which you need you, you will hear about at the Yanghui if it happens, right? But kicking it off is complicated because you need to make a choice first. But and if you start analyzing the 10 free trade zone, comparing it one to another and so on, yeah, it can get pretty daunting. So start with one or like look at a province and identify, well, in this province, is there a free trade zone I can use? If you have selected this province and there's no free trade zones in, well, move on. Find another city. Find a city within the province. There's just no free trade zone. Find local policies, but still select a province and do that process on, based on, yes, central policies being enacted, but then you'll find local programs as well and so on. Any questions? The, kind of core, the core point of, of that was to look at policies right, that are multi-layered, but selecting a province and then looking at uh, national and central programs that can help you uh, develop. And so one, one thing, uh, when, when I was talking about um, the, the, the plans and the objectives of local, lo, 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 local policy, uh, and government uh, people and, 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 and leaders, is that w where do you find their objectives? Yes, in policies like that, but mostly in, in five-year plans. Now, very few people, if you want a good read, uh, yes, the five-year plan is a good read, but I wouldn't recommend it because the five-year plan are for, generally speaking, multinational corporations that are going to be involved in the whole of China. Now, every single province, every single city receives their own part of the five-year plan, local five-year plan, right? So when you select a province, read the province five-year plan. And what, you know, what, there's nothing better than to show up in front of a government official, if not the governor, vice governor, mayor, or vice mayor, and to be aware of what are his objectives being dictated by the MDRC and being able to help him achieve that. He will be psyched about it, really. And so, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the local five-year plans, provincial or city-based, city are not translated to English. So we can help you uh, identify the portions that are relevant to your industry, or you can hire someone as well uh, internally that can, be, uh, that can do that. The NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, is the institution issuing the five-year five plans. But uh, what you need to know, and if I had an internet connections and more time, I could show you that, the NDRC websites has tens and tens and tens and tens of national development plan, right? The national development plan for the development of, uh, of, of the winter uh, sports industry. 
Yes, that, that, that exists. Uh, national development plan for the development of IT and connectivity between Internet of Things based. Names long like this, you wouldn't believe it. But every single industry that is of meaning to the government, whether it is a, an industry that represents a danger or risk or an industry that is a positive, has a development plan that has objectives into it. So this is why, again, multifaceted, right? You find a region, then how this region is affected, but then your industry as well. And all of this is all issued by the NDRC. So look it up. Look it up. Any questions on regulatory? No, I suggest a break, 1038. Uh, if you want, I can go on if you want. Wow. Well, uh, yes, question. So if we're a small company, yes. where you yourself like a joint venture type Yes. Yep. For the next two years, can I assume that that multinational company has gone through all of this work and selected Shanghai for a reason, selected this particular yeah. intervention for a reason, all those sorts of things? So can we just feeder fish off of a lot of the messaging that they? Uh, you, you should. You, uh, well, generally speaking, if you tell me that, yes, you should, especially if this corporation is involved in uh, technology, they're at the right place. But also, uh, Shanghai is generally speaking, uh, it's, 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 um, it's a massive economy. It's a massive economy. And you take a train, you're into a 350 million people ne uh, network in the area of the Hangzhou Bay. Ningbo, I didn't mention it, Ningbo is actually facing Shanghai on the Hangzhou Bay. And at the bottom of this bay, you have Hangzhou. So this whole area is about 300, 350 million Chinese. So, uh, and the policies in, in Shanghai are very well oriented on technology. So generally speaking, yes. But it could as also have been that their guys landed in Shanghai and they're like, well, you know, let's just open an office here and start here. Mo that's what most co international companies will do. But in terms of co uh, international competition as well, Shanghai is a, a cutthroat market. It's, it's everyone is there. This is a super high intensive market. So m making your way through that, if you're an SME and you are left by yourself and kind of in, in the shadow of that, but you're not fully integrated into that team and you don't have to go to Shanghai, um, you may want to diversify yourself and go into much more of a, let's say, human scale market as well. You can still be part of the, Hang, of the Hangzhou Bay um, market and be into that by going to Ningbo. And your guys will be like uh, an hour and a half train ride to uh, your, your, your joint venture partner office. And so, you, but you will be in a much more human scale city, human scale network that you will be able to kind of make organizational mapping and assessment of who are your stakeholders. It, it, if you, it, and I would also close my comment maybe on what is your team's scale into China. I've seen a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of a very interesting, innovative company send one or two guy in Shanghai. The guys just get drowned into a sea of people and contacts and meetings. And, 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 and so if you send them in, more, in a more human scale area, they'll be able to open an office and hold the right meetings and everything. When I was in China, I could have gone to a government meeting or conference or forum and everything five days out of five. But I'm not sending emails when I'm doing that. I'm not working. I'm into a meeting, right? But this is the disconnect between the leaders and the working level people. The leaders are in meetings. They're connecting. They're doing the networking. That's what they should do in, in China. So if you're, you need to decide as well, which is shown in an HR strategy, is the guy you're, you're sending a, a working level, a general manager, or is he kind of a, a, a chief rep, right? Just holding those government meetings and say, saying that he cannot be both, or if he is, know that he will work 14 hours a day just to make it happen. That's the thing. So, Yes? Would you share a copy of your slides? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're available. Yeah, for sure. Uh, any other questions? All 100 slides. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> let's, let's take a 10 minute break, maybe uh, 10.55. Uh, let's speed up and uh, continue. Not to say